knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. It's no secret that many living organisms, like humans, must consume other organisms in order to survive. For this reason, we are called heterotrophs. But there are also autotrophs, organisms that make their own food. Let's review these terms and point out some key details regarding energy flow and nutrient cycling as they pertain to ecology. First, let's examine autotrophy. Producers are autotrophs, or self-feeding organisms. Primary producers are usually plants and other photosynthesizers, which serve as a gateway for energy to enter food webs, or networks of organisms that eat each other. In almost all ecosystems, photosynthesizers are the only such gateway. If photosynthesizers were removed, the flow of energy would be cut off, and the other organisms would run out of food. In this way, photosynthesizers lay the foundation for every light-receiving ecosystem. Plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria act as producers. These organisms make their own organic molecules from carbon dioxide. Photoautotrophs like plants use light energy to build sugars out of carbon dioxide. The energy is stored by virtue of the chemical bonds of the molecules, which are used as fuel and building material by the plant. The energy that can be released through the metabolism of organic molecules is passed to other organisms in the ecosystem when those organisms eat plants or eat other organisms that have previously eaten plants. In this way, all the consumers, or heterotrophs, of an ecosystem, including herbivores, carnivores, and decomposers, rely on the ecosystem's producers for energy. If the producers were removed, the community would collapse. That's because energy isn't recycled. Instead, it's dissipated as heat as it moves through the ecosystem and must be constantly replenished. In ecology, productivity is the rate at which energy is added to the bodies of organisms in the form of biomass. Biomass is simply the amount of matter that's stored in the bodies of a group of organisms. Productivity can be defined for any trophic level or other group, and it may take units of either energy or mass. There are two basic types of productivity, gross and net. To illustrate the difference, let's consider primary productivity, which is the productivity of the primary producers of an ecosystem. Gross primary productivity, or GPP, is the rate at which solar energy is captured in sugar molecules during photosynthesis. GPP represents the amount of energy captured per unit area per unit time. Producers, such as plants, use some of this energy for metabolism and cellular respiration, and some for growth or building tissues. Net primary productivity, or NPP, is a term that represents gross primary productivity minus the rate of energy loss to metabolism and maintenance. In other words, it's the rate at which energy is stored as biomass by plants or other primary producers and made available to the consumers in the ecosystem. Net primary productivity varies among ecosystems and depends on many factors. These include solar energy input, temperature and moisture levels, carbon dioxide levels, nutrient availability, and community interactions, like grazing by herbivores. Next, let's move on to heterotrophy, including herbivory and predation. Once again, a heterotroph is an organism that cannot produce its own food, instead taking nutrition from other sources of organic carbon. Predation can be defined as an interaction in which one organism, the predator, eats all or part of the body of another organism, the prey. Herbivory is a form of predation, but the prey organism is a plant instead of an animal. With a diet comprised of only plants, herbivores can be surprisingly large animals. Examples of large herbivores include cows, elk, and buffalo. These animals eat grass, tree bark, aquatic vegetation, and shrubby growth. Herbivores can also be medium-sized animals such as sheep and goats, which eat shrubby vegetation and grasses. Small herbivores include rabbits, chipmunks, squirrels, and mice. These animals eat grass, shrubs, seeds, and nuts. An ecosystem must provide abundant plant life to sustain herbivores, and many of them spend the majority of their lives eating to stay alive. If plant availability declines, herbivores may not have enough to eat. This could cause a decline in herbivore numbers, which would also impact carnivores. 
Herbivores usually have special biological systems to digest a variety of different plants. Their teeth also have special features that enable them to rip off the plants and then grind them up with flat molars, making them easier to digest. Now a bit more on nutrient flow. Decomposition is the first stage in the recycling of nutrients that have been used by an organism, whether plant or animal, to build its body. It is the process whereby the dead tissues break down and are converted into simpler organic compounds. These are the food source for many of the species at the base of ecosystems. The species that carry out the process of decomposition are known as detritivores. Detritivore literally means feeders of dead or decaying organic matter. Many of these decomposer species function in tandem or parallel with one another. Each is responsible for a specific part of the decomposition process. Collectively, they are known as the detritivore community. A wide range of organisms takes part in the decomposition process. Most of them are inconspicuous and unglamorous. From a conventional human perspective, they are even undesirable. The detritivore community includes insects such as beetles and their larvae, as well as flies and maggots, which are fly larvae. It also includes wood lice, fungi, slime molds, bacteria, slugs and snails, millipedes, springtails, and earthworms. Most of them work out of sight, and their handiwork isn't immediately obvious, but they are the forest's unsung heroes of recycling. Almost all of them are tiny, and their activity happens gradually in most cases, over months or years. But together, they convert dead plants and animals into forms that are usable either by themselves or other organisms to sustain the ecosystem. The primary decomposers of most dead plant material are fungi. Dead leaves fall from trees, and herbaceous plants collapse to the ground after they have produced seeds. These form a layer of litter on the soil surface, which can be quite substantial in volume. The litter fall in a Scots pine is around 1 to 1.5 tons per hectare per year, while that in temperate deciduous forests is over 3 tons per hectare per year. The litter is quickly invaded by the hyphae of fungi. Hyphae are the white thread-like filaments that are the main body of a fungus, while the mushrooms that appear on the forest floor are merely the fruiting bodies of the fungus, as we have learned in the mycology series. The hyphae draw nourishment from the litter. This enables the fungi to grow and spread, while breaking down the structure of the dead plant material. Bacteria also play a part in this process, as do various invertebrates, including slugs, snails, and springtails. As the decay becomes more advanced, earthworms begin their work. Fungi play a key role in breaking down plants, but this isn't the case when it comes to dead animal matter. The vast majority of the decomposers in this case are other animals and bacteria. Animal decomposers include scavengers and carrion feeders. These consume parts of an animal carcass, using it as an energy source. They also convert it into the tissues of their own bodies and the dung they excrete. These animals range from foxes and badgers to birds, such as the hooded crow. They also include invertebrates, such as carrion flies, blow flies, and various beetles. Their dung is, in turn, eaten by other organisms, particularly dung beetles and burying beetles. Some fungi, including the dung roundhead, grow out of dung, helping to break it down. Other fungi even help break down animal matter. One example of this is the scarlet caterpillar club fungus. This species grows out of the living pupa or larva of a moth or butterfly. It converts the body of its host into a fruiting body, which is club-shaped and orange, with a pimply surface. Not all animal carcasses are immediately consumed by large scavengers. In these cases, there are five main stages in the decomposition process. The first of these is when the corpse is still fresh. At this stage, carrion flies and blowflies arrive and lay their eggs around the openings, such as the nose, mouth, and ears. In the second stage, the action of bacteria inside the corpse causes putrefaction. These bacteria produce gases which cause the carcass to swell. This is anaerobic decomposition, or decay in the absence of air. It is characterized by its bad smell, in contrast to the odorless nature of aerobic decomposition. The next stage commences when the skin of the corpse is ruptured. The gases escape and the carcass deflates again. In this decay stage, the maggots proliferate and consume much of the soft tissue. Predators such as wasps, 
ants, and beetles also arrive to feed on the fly larvae. In the following stage, only cartilage, skin, and bones remain. At this point, different groups of flies and beetles, along with their parasites, take over the decomposition process. Finally, only bones and hair remain, and they can persist for several years or more. Eventually, even these are consumed. For example, mice and voles will gnaw on old bones to obtain the calcium they contain. Clothes moths help break down hair or feathers. The progression through these stages depends to some extent on the time of year when death occurs, but typically it takes several months from beginning to end. With some key aspects of energy flow and nutrient cycling understood, let's now widen our scope and examine entire food webs. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.